Have you ever wanted to power your home with an Opus power station? I'm Scott and I'm going to show you how I did it with my Mega One and B2 battery and a manual transfer switch. This is the second phase of my scalable backup power solution for my house. Now previously I'd purchased some rigid panels to max out the solar input on the Mega One and now I'm installing a transfer switch and mounting the panels in the backyard. A transfer switch basically transfers part or all of your electric load from grid power to a generator or power station. There are several kinds of transfer switches. Some are automatic, meaning they automatically switch to the generator when the power goes out. Some are for the whole home or whole breaker box, where you completely switch all power from grid to a power station. And then there are critical load switches. These allow you to select your most important circuits to power with a generator or power station. I went with a critical load manual transfer switch. I don't have enough power in my system to handle my whole home. I did buy a switch that has a little more than I need right now because I want to be able to scale up in the future. You can find manual switches that have from one circuit up to 10 circuits in various sizes from 15 amps to 100 amps. This is a 30 amp switch with six circuits. It can do both 120 volts and 240 volts. So I'm ready when Opus finally releases that 240 volt power station in the future. But for now, it will be set up as a 120 volt switch, and I'll have all six circuits hooked up even though I won't be able to power them all at the same time until I scale up my system. One of the things I'm really looking forward to is being able to switch to solar power on certain circuits at will. So most of the house can be running off the grid, but I can have a circuit or two powered for my solar panels. Now I really think I should be able to run my refrigerator with solar power 24 hours a day as long as we have decent sun. So which circuits will I power? So you should approach this the same way you do when you're deciding what power station you need to buy. There are things that you need to have powered all the time. So you start with those circuits and then you move to, you know, circuits that would be nice to have power on and you keep going until you have all of your circuits filled in your transfer switch. This transfer switch has two 20 amp circuits, which can be tied together in a 240 volt application, but for my needs, we'll have them separate. My two 20 amp circuits are going to be plugs in my kitchen. One set that powers the refrigerator and microwave and another set that we could use for anything else we need in there. That leaves four 15 amp circuits. My old house has some very odd wiring, so we made some choices that may seem a little bit weird, but we're working with what we have available. So I chose my main bedroom plugs, the plugs for my bathroom, and a few other plugs that happen to also be on that circuit, my den plugs, and a set of garage plugs. Now you're probably wondering why garage plugs? You just plug into your power station right out there in the garage. I have a plan to add a small mini split in the future, and the garage plugs will be the circuit that powers that air conditioner. I would also love to use solar power to cool at least part of my home. Now I know you can buy specific solar powered mini splits, but those require certain amounts of panels and voltage and generally share solar and grid power together. It's just gonna be simpler for me to buy a small mini split and use it either as grid power or with solar power as I scale up, and then I can run more, more off solar in the future. This is the area where I need my transfer switch installed. My old house has old wiring, and I decided early on to use an electrician for this install. It was harder than you might imagine to find someone to do this. Several companies I called told me they only do whole home automatic switches with gas generators, period. Others didn't seem to understand what I was wanting. Still others only wanted to use switches that I didn't want to use. So I finally decided to buy the switch kit myself and then use a company I'd worked with before on my day job. Which over on the 20 amp side, it's our kitchen outlets. And then some plugs in the den, master bedroom bathroom plugs and this unknown plug is actually in the garage and outside but that is six circuits I've marked them on the breakers themselves and I've marked them on this list I will say with the old house I mean the things that are marked here are not necessarily what is actually powered by these breakers so you definitely want to go through and double check and make sure what you think you're going to be working on is actually what's going to be worked on so I have the switch, I've chosen and marked my circuits to attach, and I have the electrician coming to install. During the install, the electrician found one of my breakers had a strip lug, so I ran out to get a new one. You can see the open breaker box here, all the old 1970s wiring. The switch mounts right next to the box, and the conduit runs down and into the wall through this plate, entering the panel here. You'll notice this switch has a four-pronged 30 amp plug, and I'm running a Mega One. Now, if I had a Mega 2 or 3, I would adapt the 3 prong 30 amp plug into the 4 prong 30 amp, but I need to convert the 4 prong to a regular Edison plug. So the kit came with this heavy duty cable, which is 10 feet long, 4 prong to 4 prong. I've got this adapter here that I bought, 4 prong to Edison. 
Now you can see I've shaved some edges off of this. I'll show you why in a second, but if I wanted to use it just like it was, of course, these are twist lock, and then you would plug it in here. Now you see that little light came on. That means that I'm actually plugged in, sending to this. This is a little long on the cable. Also not super secure, so I don't really like it, but it will work. Uh, there is another thing that I have, another way I've done this, and let me show you what that is real quick. So this adapter, uh, with it shaved off like it is, will actually fit right up in here. And then twist it. It's all good. And then I bought this three foot long 12 gauge extension cord. Uh, it's not quite as heavy duty as the other one, but I'm not sending 30 amps of power. Remember, I'm only sending 20 amps of power. Um, and let's plug it in. There. And then plug it in here. So we are, again, wired in. Got power coming out here and going over to the transfer switch. I have my solar panel out and they are getting about 740 watts. Not too bad out there in the driveway. Um, soon we'll be having them in the backyard, charging things up. And I actually have three circuits on right now. Um, I have the main circuit for my refrigerator. I have my master bedroom circuit, which has a ceiling fan actually attached to that. So that's running. And then I have the garage plugs. Um, and that is currently pulling steady 140, 147 watts. You can see all of my circuits over here in the main breaker box are still on, except for that spare one down there at the bottom. And all the circuits over here are still on. What controls where the power comes from are these switches here. Um, if it's in the up switch, it's on generator or in this case, power station. Middle is off and down is line, which is grid power. Now remember, the Mega One has a 2000 watt inverter, so I wanna make sure I don't pull too much power. The Mega One is using one 20 amp circuit to power a 30 amp switch, so I can't do too much or there are gonna be some issues. So let me test some of those circuits. Uh, you can see here that I am pulling uh, really no wattage right now. So I'm gonna switch this to refrigerator. And you see it spikes up. It's hitting around 150 watts there until it settles down, 140 watts. So if I go ahead and switch over to the other circuit, we won't see much of a change because there's not much being pulled off. There's just a couple little things plugged in, very low wattage. I think I'm charging a battery. So I'm gonna switch that back. If I switch this one to the DIN, we'll see. Again, not much change, a little bit it went up, but I don't have my very large television on. All right, so maybe somebody turned it on just a second ago because now it is, um, cranking up. When I really pull that um, big TV, it's a very old LED LCD screen, and so it pulls a lot of power. Uh, so then here's the master bedroom. In the master bedroom, we have clocks and a ceiling fan running right now. And so you can see not a huge amount of power draw there. So, so far with three circuits on, and really I could go ahead and do four circuits on, I'm only pulling 240. So bathroom again very little power draw there because there's nothing really happening like if someone was blow drying their hair we would see a much bigger power draw so that's what you got to watch out for and then here is the sixth circuit so everything is on and this of course is a garage circuit which also has nothing plugged into it so with everything going really it's only the refrigerator and a couple of very small lights i mean we're pulling 240 watts of power uh, not huge amounts of power by any means um, and easily recoupable with an 800 watt that um, array that might be bringing in, depending on clouds, six to 750 watts of power. Um, so yeah, we could definitely run all this uh, as it's currently using power forever, as long as we had good power like during the day. Now at night, you can see, according to this, we have about seven hours, eight hours of power left. Um, that's not good, it won't last from sunset to sun up. And so we would eventually run out of power and all these circuits would turn off. So I don't really want that to happen. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn this back all the way down. So this is just the master bedroom and the uh, main refrigerator plug. 
So these are running right now. And so let me show you what happens whenever I turn on the microwave. Now the microwave is a full size microwave. We have a smaller microwave that I would use during a power outage if I needed to use one. I would try not to use a microwave just because it draws a lot of power. Um, but as it is without the big microwave on, we've got nine hours, eight, hour, eight or nine hours of power left in this power bank with the B2 battery. And so uh, let me go see, let me just show you what happens whenever I power on, you will see this and it may even trip because it's gonna be so close to the inverter limit and it will not like it. Uh, because again, it, you just have to be mindful of the 2000 watt inverter here. If I had a larger power station that could you know, push more power, uh, you know, it wouldn't be as big of a deal. But let me show you what happens when I get really close. So hold on. Right, you can hear my microwave's noise. You can see I'm at 1800 watts just about and it does not like it. It is pulling too much power. Um, so I'll go ahead and turn that off so I don't hurt it. And of course, as soon as I turn it off, it drops right back down. So really, this large microwave, if the compressor is running, I just it just pulls too much current or something in this old house. It does not like it. So even though I'm not tripping the inverter, it's just something I have to watch out for. As I already said, most of the time, whenever I'm gonna be in a power outage, I'm only going to be like using smaller appliances. I'm not gonna be using that big one. It's critical that I keep power use in mind. If I have the refrigerator and a microwave on, I've pretty much maxed out the inverter. So if I use those with another circuit on, the lights flicker and I'm very close to tripping the inverter. All right, let's get some solar to the power station. And I can always drag my solar sled out in the driveway just like I have been. I've been running it most of the time we had this on, but I wanna mount these so that they're out all day. Now my backyard faces toward the south. This section of wall gets sun starting about 9 a.m. and that lasts till about 4 p.m. when the sun shades over the yard with more direct sun in the middle of the day. Now, there are a lot of how-to videos on installing these, so I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, but my basic plan is to remove the grass in the area, secure the solar mount to wood pieces that are in turn secured to the ground. I decided not to drive wooden posts into the ground in hopes that the metal is gonna last longer. Those anchors aren't here yet, so I'm gonna install them when they are. In the meantime, I'm gonna go ahead and get power into the garage and into the Mega One. I'm gonna use this small piece of conduit to go through the wall. Now this is a short run, almost directly from the panels to the wall. If I was running across the lawn, I would use a piece of conduit and bury it. Now I have a few more things to do out here, including earthing or grounding the mount. There's some debate about the necessity of this, but it's a fairly simple thing to do, and it could help direct the lightning strike away from my system. In the meantime, let's get things hooked up. It's getting late in the afternoon. I'm actually starting to get a little bit shaded, uh, but even so, I'm still almost 500 watts coming in from the 800 watts of worth of panels out back. I currently only have my refrigerator running and the compressor's running, so you're seeing 132 watts go out. But just think about it. If for six hours, I was able to average 500 watts. Now during the peak sun, I'm getting six to seven. I actually saw 790, 780 watts earlier, if I'm able to get an average of 500 watts for six hours, that means that I will refill 3000 watt hours of battery, which just happens to be the entire capacity of my Mega One and B2 battery. That's pretty cool. So six hours, I could theoretically use 3000 watt hours of power. Currently my draw isn't going to do that. Uh, if I didn't have solar coming in, this 130 watts, it doesn't run all the time. On average, I'm seeing about a 90 watts an, 90 watts an hour average for the refrigerator to use. So I could run the refrigerator for 90 watts an hour for 24 hours. So that's a little over 2000 watt hours of battery. But again, I'm replenishing upwards of 3000 watt hours. So as long as there's several hours of sun, my refrigerator will run 24 seven on just solar power alone. Now, when we start adding other things, we start running other circuits or you know, other kinds of stuff, we'll start drawing more power off. But in a power outage, if I just wanted to focus on keeping my refrigerator running, I could literally keep it going 24 seven as long as I got a few hours of sun a day. Really at 500 watts, and again, in peak sun, I'm seeing more than that. 
if we have an average of 500 watts incoming from solar, I could be getting 2,000 watt hours of battery replenished, which is basically what I need to run that 24 hours a day. I could be getting that in four hours of good sun. So even on a partly cloudy day, I might be able to keep that going. So fully clouds, storms, rain, that kind of stuff, obviously that's not gonna happen. But whenever there is sun, when I have sun, I should be able to run the fridge 24 seven in the outage. And generally I can just run it whenever I want to, to shave a little bit off my power, keep that power bill, um, you know, down a little bit. So now we can later scale up. We've talked about that. It is ready to scale up with either more batteries, more panels, or a larger inverter and larger battery capacity power station like the Mega 2 or the Mega 3. That's my new manual transfer switch and panel install for my backup system. It's relatively small right now, but it can scale up as I have more budget and opportunity. I can increase the solar input. I can swap out the Mega 1 with a power station that has a larger inverter like a Mega 2 or 3. Later, I can rework the system even to allow for 240 volts. There's, so there's, there's more I can do, but this is a good start for a backup home system. So let me give you a rundown of what everything cost. Now the Shadow Flux panels are normally $250 each, but I caught a sale and got them for $195 each. The upgraded solar mount was $130. The transfer switch kit is $300. Now the electrician's gonna vary based on your location. I got quotes between $650 and $850. And the various cables and adapters and conduits can add up, not to mention the bits and pieces that secure things to the ground. But when that's all done, it's gonna be about $450. The Mega One is currently on sale for $417, and Opus normally has some good sales going on. The B2 is currently on sale for $680, and of course you can always look at refurbish units on eBay. So for this project, you would spend between $3,450 and $3,650, or if you, you know, wanna save a few hundred dollars and you feel like you can do the electric wiring yourself, uh, you could save even more, but if you're not sure about that, I'd recommend hiring an electrician. If you did it yourself, you'd be well under $3,000. And since this power station is over three kilowatt hours, those components should also qualify for the solar tax credit. Talk to your tax professional about that. I think that ends this year. So here we have a system that can power critical circuits, be replenished with solar power, help you save money on your electric bill and keep you going during an outage. And I'm ready to scale up when I want, adding more batteries and more panels and eventually upgrading to a mega two or three. What would be the critical loads in your transfer switch? Leave a comment below. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. And if you want to see more videos like this, make sure you subscribe. You can check out other videos on similar topics over at my own channel, at Scott Link Media, and I'll see you on the next one.